Welcome to the Seniors Flourish podcast, where it's all about helping occupational therapy practitioners working with older adults be the best they can be. And now your host, Mandy Chamberlain. Hi, everyone. Before we get started, I wanted to talk about Seniors Flourish's sponsor, Great Seminars and Books. What I really like is that their mission is focusing on geriatric rehabilitation education and training for clinicians, which, as you know, is near and dear to my heart. They have great live courses focusing on topics such as clinical orthopedics, cancer rehab, or even topics such as clinical neurology. There is a course for anyone looking for evidence-based practice and treatment ideas while working with the older adult population. These are definitely some topics that I am interested in, and I think you should check them out too. So head on over to SeniorRehabProject.com backslash great and use my promo code SRP25 to get $25 off your next course. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Seniors Flourish podcast. I am your host, Manny Chamberlain, occupational therapist. And today we are talking all about home health, trying to decide if home health is for you, the good, the bad, the ugly. And then we have all sorts of things. We're going to be talking about goal setting, typical days, common diagnoses, and giving away lots of free goodies um, and gifts to everyone um, that can help you in your practice and tons of links. And I'm just, there's just so much. And so I'm so excited um, that I am welcoming, welcoming Monika Wukashevich. No, did I say that yeah. right? Yeah. Oh, pretty darn close. Sure. Like, yeah. that's an air high five right there. <laughs> it's an air high five. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm really excited to talk to you because we're going to talk all about home health and just getting like, having people understand and listen to like, what is, what is it like really to be a home health OT and um, just get some really great information and things that they can take um, and use right away. So thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's my pleasure, Mandy. And a huge <laughs> thank you to you too. On behalf of OTs, I just truly want to thank you for trying something new as an OT too. And just recognizing that, that it's like you are paving the way in I feel like multiple directions, especially with the podcast. So just a, a huge thank you and a huge hello, especially to the home health OTs or perhaps future OTs out there. Ah, thanks. I know it's the podcast is super exciting and I feel like it's such a great avenue and a great way for everyone just to get some good information and yeah. I don't know, just talk about OT, like, you know, it, get people excited about it and get people excited about working with older adults because I feel like it's a population sometimes that's not like, quote, sexy, like people get excited <laughs> about because pediatrics is super fun or like there's, there's, it, you know, it's playful and that kind of thing. And mm-hmm. working with older adults is can be super rewarding. So I just like, and there's lots of us out there working with the population. So I just want to make sure that, you know, we have an, uh, an avenue and somewhere to discuss it. So anyway, I'm just glad you're here. So let's talk a little bit about your journey. Like how did you get into OT and what are you doing today? So I got into OT as a bit of a non-traditional student, actually. I had studied two years of communication and then uh, realized that that was not where I wanted to go, or at least not where I wanted to keep accruing debt, because I didn't know what I would doing with a degree in communication at the time. So I left school and I worked for a different company and realized I was so bored. It was like a cubicle job. And I was like, I can't do this. So I actually took a personality test and it hooked me up with OT. And I, really? I yeah. And the first, um, the first thought I had was I'd find people jobs. And then yeah. I read about it and I was like, Oh my gosh, I could get paid to. And what, what hooked me in was that it was both a science and an art. Mm-hmm. And the more I read about it, I was like, I would do that stuff even if I didn't get paid to do it. So yeah, <laughs> let's check that out. Yeah. Um, that's cool. So that was kind of the the buy in, and a shout out to Nebraska because I I'm from Nebraska and that's where I was <gasps> trained as an OT. Mm-hmm. Hey, shout out to Nebra- Midwest. I'm from North Dakota, so Midwest. <laughs> <laughs> and the, and then eventually that's taken me to where I am today, which is in actually Eugene, Oregon, practicing home health. In the first couple of years, I actually did local contract assignments. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would. 
you know, I was able to stay in Omaha, but help at different facilities, be it skilled nursing or outpatient or acute rehab or acute, just regular acute care. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, I guess the thing that led me into home health was that I just, I felt unsettled and I think I'd probably say a little bit bored, especially Mm -hmm. In I was in a sniff and I was mm-hmm. just like, I feel like there's not more. for you. Yeah. 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 Um, and then I <clears throat> I was fortunate to find a nonprofit in you here in Eugene, Oregon, that I feel so grateful to be working for as a home health therapist. Wow. <clears throat> so you moved from Nebraska over to you or uh Oregon. Yeah, Eugene, Oregon. Yeah. Well, I've heard Eugene is beautiful, actually. Isn't that where like all the seals are and it's on the coast? Or am I thinking it's something totally different? No, that actually, that's part, that's, I th- I'd say Eugene's in that category. There's also some <laughs> whale watching and the Ooh. beautiful, it's so funny. I'm sure if you talk to people from Eugene, like right yeah. now and, and like a month ago, people would be like, ah, it's debatable how beautiful it is because it's, <laughs> there's so much rain, but oh, yeah. give us like 10 days to three months and we'll, you know, that's why we live here because yeah. the summers are beautiful. Oh, I know. I haven't, I actually have never been over there, but <gasps> it's on it? the list. It's on yeah. the list. I know. Yeah. So why do you love our home health? Like what, what, what makes that kind of hit all the, check Jam? all the boxes? Yeah. 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 For me, I love the creativity of it. I feel like it's allowed me as an OT to practice more in the ways that I always wanted to. Which, you know, some people might be like, well, what does that mean? So for mm-hmm. me, it's that I I can really be in people's environments and maximize my skills. So, for example, um, when I'm in people's houses, like this is something I actually thought of the other day is I was helping a woman uh, improve her independence and safety with showering. Mm-hmm. So in home health, you get to see the shower setup. So, yeah. for example, one of the things I was able to um, help her with and uh, I guess a heads up to other OTs if you haven't heard this yet, but you can cut off the leg of a pantyhose, drop the soap in it, and tie it around like a, a bar or a grab bar of the chair. So if they drop it, they don't have to bend over really deep and like, you know, chase the soap around the shower. Mm-hmm. So we got her set up with that. And then when she dropped her handheld shower head down because she didn't have a hook, it would, of course, spray water like right underneath the shower bench where there's like that one opening, you know? Yes. And I was like, of course. So I just tightened the top and then it ended up turning the water to actually spray at the wall. But it's like, you can't do that in any other setting except home health. And those are the things she really needed. So I love that those tweaks are available and the, the X, the expanse, I guess I would say of, I just, well, and I guess every setting has their expanse that OTs get into. Yeah. But what I like is um, I really sense that I get to connect with people's like what what's kind of like that sweet spot. Like what's my patient's sweet spot? Like what do you really want? And I feel like I'm in a place because I'm in their environment that I'm more mm-hmm. capable of being able to help them have resources for that and to yeah. be really creative with it. I know. No, that makes, no, that makes exact, or er, makes complete sense. When I, you know, when I did home health, those are the exact same reasons why I really enjoyed it. You can't get much more occupation based um, and do occupational therapy than you can in the home. I think mm-hmm. that you can replicate things as much as you can in the clinic and you can ask people about their routines and how they perform certain things. Like if you ask someone, what do you do in the shower? Do you wash your hair first? Do you wash your feet first? What What do you like to do? And people are like, I don't know. I've been mm-hmm. doing it for 50 years. Mm-hmm. I Not something that you sit and think about. But, right. and then when you replicate that, you know, it's, it's in a different environment. It's not exactly being as occupation-based. You're being as occupation-based as you can in the clinic, but it's, you know, it's not the same as being in the home. And those are the things that I actually really miss about home health. And those are the things I really appreciate about home health. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I completely, completely agree. So what do you feel is um, OT's role like in home health, like in the interdisciplinary team? What is, where do we shine? Sure. I think with the interdisciplinary team being uh, skilled nursing, literally nursing, PT, mm-hmm. OT, speech, 
home health aides and social workers. That's who's on my particular team. Mm -hmm. I think where we shine is being able to see the big functional picture for people um, and not just looking at the here's what's happening today, but kind of like the big forecast of what's happening. Mm -hmm. Because so I guess more specifically, we're looking at safety, fall prevention. We're looking at how are they actually doing with taking their medications? Um, not just what are their meds, but are they able to refill them? Can they open the bottle? Did they take them today? And that we can, I, I feel like we fill in a lot of gaps because I know recently we've started collaborating more with nursing on medication management. Mm -hmm. And at first, and I guess this is also just something that I want to acknowledge any OT out there who's who's doing this. And I, I think there's a lot of OTs that are, but as just trying something new to forge into new territories where we can help, but maybe where in the past we didn't go there. And I think mm -hmm. like meds, chronic disease management, things like that are some of those places. But we had to kind of clarify like, well, what is nursing doing? What is OT doing? That's different right. in regard to meds management. And, and that it's like, the nurses can go in and say, here are your meds. Here are the side effects. Um, let's fill this pill box. Right. But the OT is in there to say, are you actually able to accurately fill it by yourself? And why not? If not, what's going on? And then how can I help remedy that? Mm -hmm. um, and I guess ultimately to really advocate for the client and their yeah. goals. Um, because I do think that's also something that's really unique for OT is that we, we've been specifically trained to be as client based as possible. So even when I don't totally agree with people and what their goals are, yes. I try to at least give them a chance, you know, uh, mm -hmm. within that's reason. And that's sometimes, I think sometimes challenging in the sense yeah. that, um, you know, from my experience, you have somebody that I don't know has a goal of wanting to be able to smoke, honestly. There's a prime example. I can think of one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Obviously, I'm not advocating for that, but it's like, think about like the client's occupations and what is important to them. Yeah. Or if they don't want to be able to get dressed and they just literally want to wear pajamas, like you have to also kind of respect that. Like you can't make a goal on getting dressed if that's not what they want to do, even though it's something that I feel, you know, we feel is important that we feel that we should be working on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's being absolutely client centered and figuring out what, what they need is sometimes I think a conflict of, I don't know, co not conflict of interest isn't the right word, but like, you know, it's, it's conflicting. Yeah. Do you find, if you ever found that? Yes, I have. And one of the phrases that I think it's like, there's a personal and professional difference, you know, where I'm like, oh yeah, I, you know, I get that. I want you to have a life that you get to experience your own consequences, you know, from mm -hmm. your choices and what's helped me in conversations where on a professional level, I have to disagree. And I just tell people that, or I tell the sons and daughters is, you know, if the son or daughter is the caregiver and the patient's wanting to do, say it's bathing or cooking and they have a a cognitive impairment and it is mm -hmm. not safe to do that. I will right. just try to say something as clear as possible. Like, um, do from the screening that I've done, there is a cognitive impairment. Here's some things I've observed. Mm -hmm. It's my best professional opinion yes. that this person not be cooking. And mm -hmm. I'm here to give you my professional opinion. Yep. And then I usually say, you know, take, take what you like. You, you may disagree with me on this, but I need to give you my professional opinion. Mm -hmm. And that helps me feel like it's not like a blow to them, like, do this or else, you know? <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right. Yeah, because I mean, it is our job to tell them what we think and what is, you know, our professional opinion. And sometimes I feel like we want to tiptoe around those mm -hmm. things. And it's really important to know, like, we need to cover our bases and we need to make sure that we're documenting things appropriately, that we're instructing things appropriately and educating our patients appropriately and family, of course. Yeah. But, um, you know, we need to, we need to do that. And so even if they are not going to comply, then you can document that they are not going to comply. They stated, I do not agree or I am not going to do that. <laughs> and I literally do a lot of quotes in my yeah. in my documentation when it's something that I feel it puts them at risk for whatever reason. And um, mm -hmm. so that we're, you know, like you said, 
changing or distinguishing between your personal opinion on it and what our professional recommendations are. And I think also on to build on that is to to really be part of a relationship with them too, because I think in in some of that authentic vulnerable dialogue, there's mm-hmm. really val- valuable information that no one has like dug for, and and not like aggressively dug for. But there are times where if I have enough rapport with the person, that I'll say, I'm wondering why you don't want to do that. Like if mm-hmm. if. X is your goal, you know, like if you want to be able to walk longer and go shopping more and you want to be able to smoke, I'm just mm-hmm. curious of of why you haven't stopped smoking and not making it judgmental, but just truly being Absolutely. like curious with them because it's amazing how sometimes people are like, well, I don't know. I've never thought about that. Yeah. Um, or I had a woman actually recently who had <laughs> a pretty consistent history of like AMA against medical Mm. advice, like DC Mm -hmm. home. Um, And so when I was out there to eval her, I just said, because of course she lives alone. The goal is stay home alone as long as possible with caregivers Mm -hmm. uh, in stage or stage four COPD. Mm. And so I just said, what do you think is the most important thing that you might need to change or that is important for me to know in Mm -hmm. helping you? get this goal. And she said, whatever it is better not cost that much. Or she's like, I really need, I really need to watch my pennies. Mm -hmm. And like right away, that was actually really helpful for her to just be that specific that it's like, okay, if I'm recommending adaptive equipment, she's probably going to want to make it. Um, Right. So it's just little things like that though, that are meaningful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's, it just kind of emphasizes the importance of building rapport with your patients and Mm -hmm. using your therapeutic use of self, which is one of those terms that I think gets overused, just use your therapeutic use. But I actually find, I think that's one of the most important skills that we have as OTs because you can kind of see what the patient needs and then be able to fulfill that need. I mean, like some patients want it black and white. They want, Mm -hmm. they want the facts. They want, you know, they're, all business or they want to, you know, and then some really need joking around and having fun. And, you know, like you have to be able to use those skills to build that rapport in order to help the patient succeed towards their goals is yeah. kind of how I see it. And I feel like if you can kind of really hone in on those skills, it opens the doors for everything because you're not fighting your patients. <laughs> fighting is the right word. You know, like you're not... You're all on the same path because you're all on the same team. And it's just like trying to figure out what everybody has and what everybody needs to accomplish those goals. Oh, that's but- huge. I would love to see more research on therapeutic use of self too, because I think it's like this great thing. And mm-hmm. for some people, I think it comes more natural than others. And so it's Absolutely. kind of like, well, what is it exactly? <laughs> and as like uh, a bit of a, a heads up for people discerning home health There is a lot of phone calls involved in home health, too, that I don't think people necessarily realize. But even today, I had to make a couple phone calls to patients. And some people don't like to be on the phone. And at least for me with my home health company, I make all my own appointments every morning. So Mm -hmm. that's like and even to doctor's offices. So there's a lot of talking to people on the phone. So either prepared to get comfortable with that or maybe it's not a good fit. Right. Well, let's go through kind of like a typical day. So I think for. OTs in home health companies, I don't want to give an impression that if you work for a home health company, your day is going to be like mine. Um, right. Because from what I hear, every company operates really different. And the unique thing about our company is uh-huh. we're still using paper schedules. Mm-hmm. Um, so that means that most mornings I go to the office. Um, mm-hmm. I work four to four and a half days a week. Okay. Um, so I'm more of a 32 hour OT clinically. Okay. And so Typically, though, uh, the first half hour to hour is doing um, phone calls and or like following up on something that's going on in a house, um, mm-hmm. talking to social work, communicating maybe with PTs about what's going on. And sometimes it's just making schedule changes. Now, if if you are fortunate to have an electronic system, I don't think you do that. I'm pretty sure mm. you probably are on the phone and you don't even go to the office. So right. that that alone is something that would be different. But so every morning I'm making my phone calls to patients' houses mm-hmm. and then I'm out on the road. Um, and this is also something that's different 
for every PT. So our company historically has been short on OTs. That's probably like the story of hashtag yeah. OT in general. Um, Seriously. <laughs> so, so when I started, there was one OT and oh, were there like seven PTs, including oh, wow. PTAs? Mm -hmm. <laughs> A well, lot. So anyways, yeah. um, the territory though, that we split is all of Lane County. So for some OTs, you'll have a really small area. So you'll have six probably visits a day because you're not going very far. Right. So my visits, the longest is about an hour away. Mm -hmm. So depending on my distance between, I'm seeing anywhere from three at minimum, if there's a long drive, to right. six people a day. Um, and so it's just depending on the difference between and what type of visit that is. So it can be an eval, it can be a reassessment. Um, those are really the two main types of visits that I'm doing, but sometimes cognitive visits take longer. Bathing can take right. longer. Right. And as OT, I feel like we just get not tangled up, but it's like, we think we're starting one thing and then we're like, oh boy, didn't realize. <laughs> I got to go this way instead. Right. Pandora's <laughs> box. <laughs> exactly. Hey, and so like example, I know like some home health agencies pay per visit and then some home health oh, yeah. agencies pay per hour. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think those are things that people need to kind of look at and consider and depend upon like, um, you know, what the territory, you know, that yeah. when I did home health, which has honestly been about 10 years, I did it for four years, but, um, it's been about 10 years, which is crazy since I've done home mm -hmm. health. So it's changed a lot. Like I even, I had like hardly even cell phone service in some of the places oh, cause I'm in, yeah. I'm in rural, um, Colorado, which I don't know if people think of it that way, but I'm in the mountains. And so we have, you know, a whole county or whole area to do kind of similar to yours. And so, it's the same thing, you know, some days you'd have a couple, some days you'd have a ton, but I, the agency I work for was a nonprofit and it did, um, mine was per hour, which I, yeah, there's pros and cons, there are pros and cons yeah. to both. So you don't get paid mm -hmm. as much, but I got paid to, you know, go into the office, like you said, and because we didn't have electronic system either because 10 years ago, but, mm -hmm. um, we did have computers and we'd have to sync them and it was the whole, it was a whole nother thing. But like, um, I think those are some things that people need to think about and see what the area is and if it's worth it. Cause if you're driving tons and tons and only seeing three or four patients and you know, you're getting paid per visit or what happens when you go there and like nobody's there, yeah. even though you scheduled it, which happens. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> like, are you supposed to be, aren't they supposed to be homebound? Um, right. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Right. And then well, half the times, yeah, they're either in the hospital or mm -hmm. went back for a medical appointment, but forgot to tell you. Or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah, you know, we, there's there's lots of things like you say you kind of need to consider. So you go into the clinic or go into the office, you do all mm -hmm. that morning kind of routine, get everything ready, mm -hmm. and then and from there. Oh, oh sorry. sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so I do go out from the office at least two days a week. I'm trying to start also from home on days that I can. Uh -huh. um, so then I'll head out. I just go to visits. And so it's, you know, once I'm in a house or the rest of the day is really visits and documentation. And so once I'm in a house, it's a matter of, um, so we do, our scheduling is on paper, but our documentation is online. So uh -huh. vital signs are a new, are are a unique part of home health, or maybe that's happening now in every setting. Um, when I was at the skilled nursing that was not part of every visit uh, that mm -hmm. I did as an OT, but it is in home health. So you're checking the vital signs every visit. And then typically 30 to 45 minutes um, of a session and then documenting on that. Ideally, if you can document before the next visit. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was going to say, perhaps it might be helpful too, to say that on some days, so if it's just visits, those are typically quicker. But, you know, of course, on eval days, you're doing your chart reviews, looking at team communication, trying to figure out, do they have unique scheduling needs? Do I need to call the daughter or am I calling the patient? Mm -hmm. um, so looking up those things. And then after the eval, you're writing orders to be able to go back and work with them again or discharging if it's mm -hmm. just one visit. Um, and someone recently did ask me a couple questions that might be helpful here. So right now, OTs do not do what they call a start of care. So we are one of pretty much 
The only professionals only. on the team <laughs> that, yeah, because social work can, can, no, I don't, I now I can't, no, I don't know. I don't ours know never does. So I, I'm just like assuming, I don't think they do. So PTs and nurses and technically speech and our organization speech does not do start of cares, but someone's always out there ahead of you. Um, so mm-hmm. we are at most the second person in, mm-hmm. um, so that you're always kind of following someone into the home, which I found that comforting when I was discerning OT because I was like, I don't know if I want to be in people's houses. Right. And you're like, what am I going to walk into? Mm. (laughs) And there is still some of that where I'm like, absolutely. (laughs) So what I know those, so like, I'd say kind of building on that. So how do you feel about, what do you think are some skills that you need as a therapist to be able to just like go into someone's home. I think that that is a unique, you have to have a certain level one of confidence and yeah. be able to make um, some clinical decisions on, is this safe? Is this not? Is it like, Oh, this is disgusting. I don't even want to like yeah. walk in there. And like, you know what I mean? There's, there's, mm-hmm. and then you have houses that are amazing. And so like you have this whole gamut. I yeah. think, you know, I, I personally think like you have to be a very um, a person that is just kind of accepting of, who people are and Mm -hmm. can't make those judgments. Um, Mm -hmm. What -hmm. are your thoughts on that? I think it's a really great question and really important to think about. Um, So one of the answers to this question, I actually got (laughs) at my interview with the company that I'm at now. And I said, what do you think is one of the most important skills that a team member should have in order to succeed in this setting? Because it was my first home health job. Yeah. And they said right away, flexibility. If you, Mm are not okay with your whole day falling apart um, and then just like needing to piece it back together, this setting will be too overwhelming for you. Uh And so that I've learned to be so much more flexible because that's no joke. I mean, you will have a day that falls apart sometimes like four times in the same day. (laughs) And you're you're just like, okay, well, let's start again. So flexibility for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, being willing to be in your car and that like that doesn't bother you and having, you know, having or being able to have a car that's not a gas guzzler because that will, or making sure the reimbursement will make that possible. But Mm -hmm. on a more clinical note, I think, um, and you and I talked a little bit about this before the phone call, but I do think there's value in not coming into and waiting at least a year before you come into home health as a therapist, Mm -hmm. only because, you go in with so much more of a tool belt because I feel like in home health, you're at 360. Like this is not a 180 degree view. Like you're at 360. And so there were things that working in acute care, skilled nursing that I learned about even just different diagnoses that Mm -hmm. I feel like once I was in home health, I was like, oh yeah, I've seen this. Okay, let's do this. Um, So having just clinical experience at least a year before you go in. And I think if you don't like family members being part of sessions. Mm-hmm. That's exactly <laughs> home, right. You're right. I think because there is, uh, I'd say 50% of cases now involve mm-hmm. family members um, and partly because they need to be caregivers. So right. if you prefer not to work with family members of patients, it may not be a good setting for you. Um, and I think just being able to be a, uh, what we call it? I want to say shoot from the hip, but that doesn't totally encompass it. But being Mm -hmm. able to go in with a plan and quickly change that if you notice something else has come up that's a priority. Mm -hmm. Um, Because since people are home, sometimes, especially with hospitals now, like they get out quicker. So things are more acute. So things can change fast. So um, being a real collaborator, I think, is important. I make phone calls to nursing or PT Um, or social work often, or just to the office. So just being willing to ask for help, I think is really important because you're not, you may not be at the office. So are you somebody who, if you need help, you can kind of initiate getting it and being organized, I think helps because (sighs) it does. You kind of have to, I mean, I don't know about your planner, but I remember my planner was like a mess. Like you have this tentative schedule for the week And then you get it all set up with your patients and then you, you know, call in the mornings and verify and this and that. And then it's like, okay, scratch that. If you're not somewhat organized, Mm -hmm. it's a really tough setting because you can't be, you you have to kind of think ahead and say like, okay, we're going to try, I don't know, you know, 
dressing and making sure you have the equipment or, you know, the handouts, like if you're going to try to print, you know, if you want to give them a handout or whatever, those types of things, you kind of have to plan ahead and be a bit organized. Because also, um, from my experience, and maybe you are way better about it than I uh, I was, but, you know, by Friday, I, you know, I'd see my patients and I was terrible about documentation, like after the visit mm -hmm. or whatever on Friday, because I'd be like, I want to get done. And then I'd be like, Sunday homework night. And it's just like, and that's not good either. Like that's not healthy. And that's mm -hmm. not kind of what the plan is. Like during the week, I'd do okay. Like, you know, after your visit and try to schedule it out and like, oh, and I'd be like, oh gosh, what am I doing to myself? And, but and I think that is such a real challenge in home health is that, mm -hmm. um, I think in that regard, it reminds me of the most entrepreneurial setting I've ever worked in as an OT that I kind of feel like I'm an entrepreneur out there. Like I got to advocate for myself. You know, it's like mm. you're one on one. And and there's that that guard on like time management because mm -hmm. it can be like, oh, it's seven o'clock and I am still documenting. And I'm unfortunately that has happened. And that's been like I take full responsibility of that because <laughs> let's say I got home late and I'm hungry. Yeah. And yeah. then I need to just go for a walk and then you go back. So that's not like best practice right there, but that's reality. I feel right. like, but yeah. finding ways to be like, no, I need, I need to finish these, like, you know, gotta, figuring it I out. Do it. I got to do it. Yeah. And you know, and that's, you know, the, the other, on the flip side, the benefit of home health is that you can do that. Fle you can have that flexibility. Uh, yeah. I don't know about mm -hmm. your, you know, the company that you work for. And like you were saying before, every company is different, but my company was like, you know, you have, as an OT, I made, I established my plan of care. I'm like three days a week or whatever it was, as an example. Um, in my seven days, and probably it might be different because of regulations. I'm not sure, but like in my seven days of the week, I could do my three, as long as I got my three days in it, yeah. they didn't really care. I mean, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying when I say don't care. Yeah. So like for us in Colorado, you'd be like, Ooh, Wednesday is a powder day. If I can, you know, rearrange my schedule. In the pay, it was fine, you That's know, awesome. like, yeah. but, you know, it, so like there was, there's a lot more flexibility. I think if you have kids, um, it would be amazing. Um, you know, you can, you know, if you have something going on in the morning, you can flex it. If someone wants to, see, you know, if you want to see patients after dinner and the patients are up for it, like you can do that. And like, mm -hmm. so there's so, those are the advantages. Absolutely. But then you have like, okay, did I get my paperwork done because I wanted to go skiing? Hmm, mm -hmm. maybe not or, or whatever it is. But there's, you know, there's that flexibility is, that I think a lot of people find really um, appealing. And that's one of the other reasons I think some people are really like, think about, oh, home health might not be too bad. Yeah. You know, so I don't know. How, how, what about things like durable medical equipment. That was always kind of one of my things like, okay, so you have patients that you recommend things for or how, acquiring them or people don't want to pay for them. And are like, you know, those are the th challenges, some of the challenges. Do mm -hmm. you have that? Yeah. Uh, another great question because I I think as OTs, we see really quickly how, oh, a reacher, you know, like, uh, oh, if you just had that sock aid <laughs> or um, even just like uh, arthritis assistant aids. Mm -hmm. So it's a good question. So what do we do when there is a recommendation for DME and the patient either can't afford it, can't go get it um, mm -hmm. and or doesn't want it. So right. what I come up with a lot is we, one of the things I developed was a handout that had all the local medical suppliers and we are fortunate to have some really good used medical supply places in town. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of them, actually. So one of the things I do is I'll make the recommendation. And on that form, I left a space on the bottom for like recommended equipment so they can mm -hmm. more easily follow up. Because right. I, I, the approach that I've started to take, because this can be such an energy yes. consuming thing. Um, mm -hmm. And financially, if you're an OT who's like, oh, I'll just pick that up. Um, yep. In, and our company does not support bringing things in, does not support going and like uh, picking up equipment for people because of the liability of those mm -hmm. things. So Absolutely. I usually put the information in the hands of the person who could follow through. So if it's a daughter, then the daughter needs to know about it. If the patient yeah. is cognitively with it and does, you know, like, plan their own shopping trips, then yes, they can know about it. And so right. typically, um, you know, nothing's 
most, no, I'd say 99% not of bathing DME isn't covered. Mm-hmm. So that, you know, right. Tub right. benches and shower chairs are out, but occasionally I will just write orders for the commode. Um, that's one that's come up lately. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times I just emphasize to the family or have been fortunate to have family that at least lately have been following through on those things. Or if, if I really think that they need it mm-hmm. um, and they want it, mm-hmm. and it is cost and there's a lot of other things going on, then sometimes we'll make making phone calls part of the session is yeah. like kind of developing the skills to be able to advocate and secure a support system for them, which is yep. another unique part of home health is like that big picture of can they advocate for their medical needs? Mm-hmm. You know? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And like you can integrate some of those things like into the session, like making the phone calls and, um, you know, can they order? I'm trying to think of an example. Can they order something off? Amazon <laughs> pocket talker. That was yeah. one recently. Yeah. Oh, pocket talker. Oh, good one. Yeah. You know, just just the those... guy. Yeah. You what? Well, her husband, you know, oh. I feel like this is so common where they, they buy like three different hearing aids and they're super expensive and they won't wear them. And so yes. then I was like, have you tried a pocket talker? Mm-hmm. Um, and she loved it. They, they actually are getting one. So, um, but were there things that were helpful for you in that regard that helped with the DME when those things came up? Because I like learning too what other people find. Yeah, we we had a like a DME closet in town, like a um you know talking to like um, senior centers. A lot of senior centers have that. Um, you know, it's like you say, it's really hard because you are recommending <laughs> having supplies that don't necessarily. They're not new. And so it's like, mm-hmm. like you said, the liability thing, which I completely understand. But yeah, I, I, I've done things like, um, helping them as part of the session order things mm-hmm. or, um, I, I think that's one of the most challenging things that I would find. Even things like, you know, grab bar, you know, putting yeah. a grab bar in, like, mm-hmm. honestly, like, how do you, how do you get someone to put a grab bar in if they don't have family? And it's just, there, th- those are the challenges. Um, and like I said, some OTs are better about, wanting to just pick something up for a patient and some are not. And like, it's just, it's hard, but you know, that's kind of the nature of the beast a bit. It is unfortunately. Um, yeah. yeah. And tr- <clears throat> trying to prioritize and really get clear about, do they want it? Like, are they willing to pay for it? And actually maybe this is a, um, a good place to say that I take a sales approach on a lot of this stuff. And I actually did have some selling experience, including Cutco knives back in the day. Whoa. So right? I highly <laughs> recommend them. If anyone's looking for good <laughs> cutlery, I don't sell them. If anybody's them all, looking but... into them. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but one of the things that's been helpful is when I talk to people, especially about grab bars. So this is what makes me think of it mm-hmm. is, you know, talk about the, um, the point of like rejection or like objection, excuse me. So for most people it's cost. And so I say, uh, because most of the time they're also like, I want to stay here no matter what. And so I say part of my job is to help you with your goal. And Mm -hmm. I'm looking not just at today, but I'm looking 10 years down the road and one of the highest risk areas for falls and therefore putting you back in the hospital is the Mm -hmm. bathroom. So that's why this is actually not just a one-time thing. This is an investment in your future it's your nice. safety. And sometimes yeah. that works. And sometimes it yeah, yeah. Nope. It's all about approach. Sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. <yeah. laughs> I mean, sometimes. Yeah, exactly. Well, let's shift gears a little bit. Let's talk about basic goal setting. Like, okay, let's, uh, okay, let me back up. It, what kind of assessments do you like? Do you have any s- standardized assessments that you typically use? And then from there, writing s- just some basic goals. Yeah. So to be honest, I was using more um, objective assessments for a while. Mm -hmm. I was using the modified uh, Barthel index. I've been Mm -hmm. more consistently. I really like the modified falls efficacy scale Mm -hmm. because it's so functional and it's getting a number, you know, so some people are like, "Eh, it's an objective subjective. Um, Yeah. But I've also started using a different type of cognitive screen. So it's a screen and it's called the GPCOG, General Practitioner Cognitive Screen. And it mm-hmm. was mentioned in the Alzheimer's Association. They did like a lit review on screens. And this one mm-hmm. came up as being effective, but also short. Okay. So that's been a new one that I've been trying. And then I also um, 
we've recently started to take on more of a, I was going to say comprehensive and like sustainable way to address cognition for people. Mm -hmm. So we started using more of the Allens, Mm -hmm. especially the leather lacing. So, um, but I don't typically get to the leather lacing on the first of all, unless I know that that's like the main reason that Right. We're going in because time is so limited. Absolutely. But I guess where I'm going with this is lately I've really found value and some people will probably totally disagree with me on this, but this is reality. And, and that's why I love podcasts is because we can start to talk about like the reality of things. Yeah. I really find it valuable to talk about like, what is the story of function that's happening mm-hmm. and making that as objective as possible. So the patient is only sponge bathing because of a fear of falling. In. Right. So like that will go in my assessment or um, absolutely mm-hmm. patient. Let's see. Pillbox is set up incorrectly and hasn't taken um, medications for the last two days. Like, mm-hmm. so they're not a specific objective test. And it, I guess it depends on the diagnoses too. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of where I've been at recently and i'm also trying to just stay open to you know like best practice but also time management yeah it, there's a there's a definitely a balance between that because i do absolutely agree that we have the clinical skills to make a lot of observations and i mean from the fr- time you make the appointment phone call you are assessing cognition from uh, that first second right, right? Like, yeah. can, like can they understand what i'm talking about can mm-hmm. they change appointments. I mean, you're, we're assessing from the beginning. I think the part of the push is also, you know, um, um, reimbursement systems are really requiring us to do more objective testing. And so I think there's so many and it's really hard to like filter out which ones do I use? And then like, do I use the same one for all my patients? Is that appropriate? And then, and then it's like, um, you know, like you said, some of them are really long. Like there's, um, the executive performance function, EFPT. Mm -hmm. Oh gosh, I'm going to totally butcher this. The, um, there, there's the, or the CPT, which is the cognitive oh. performance test, which is a expensive test that you have in a bag and you can take it along and, and it follows along the Allen's co- or guidelines without actually doing the leather lacing, which some people love, including me. Um, but it takes time. And so like, you have to be able to balance that and figure out where, what, for what diagnosis, what patient, what their needs are, and then make a clinical decision on what's the best, you know, evaluation, um, to get the information that you need to make the goals. And it's, it's, it's hard and it take and it does take clinical experience. And I feel like in general, um, home health sometimes, you know, I don't know. It's, 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 it's hard. I don't know. What it's, do you think about that? <laughs> it, is, it is tricky. And I would love, you know, I think it would be really interesting to interview more home health OTs because it's, mm-hmm. especially some that have been doing it for a lot longer or that, mm-hmm have a different approach because I know I, I represent one angle of, a of many, Absolutely. you know, yeah. um, and it's part of the reason why I'm really excited about the learning lab that you've mm. just started because it's like, there's evidence there, there's dialogue there, you know, like mm-hmm. there's, uh, there's just opportunity to learn. And that's, you know, so sometimes it feels humbling as no tea to be like, Oh God, there's always so much more we can be doing. And that, that, m- that managing that sweet spot, you know, like how do I find the place where I'm, I'm, I'm on my game, but I'm also not so overwhelmed that I'm, I'm able to be on my game because I just spent four hours, you know, like doing all this stuff and, and super tired. Yeah. And, I, and that's real. I am super tired. No, but the, yeah, no, that's exactly right. That's one of the reasons why I started the learning lab. Um, you know, kind of talking about home health and not starting out as right out of school. People say that and people do and people succeed. I mean, I am a prime example. I started my first job out of OT school was home health. And um, I did it for four years and I learned a lot along the way. And um, not everybody can do that. And some people do great. And I also feel like I, after that, I went to, um, I did, um, outpatient and acute care. And I learned a lot of, a lot of biomechanical, um, you know, from a more biomechanical approach, um, in outpatient, but also like you just talk about the diagnoses and understanding the medical um, implications. And, you know, looking back, I'm like, oh, I wish I would have had some of those little bit 
better skills when I was doing home health. Mm -hmm. And I use a lot of those skills in skilled nursing. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, so it's, it's, everyone's journey is different. Um, but that was one of the reasons why I started the the learning lab was because like, there's a lot of, a uh, you know, a lot of people that come out and they don't feel like they have mentorship and some organizations have amazing mentorship programs or people feel like they are prepared through their programs. Um, but you know, if you work in certain communities, like where I started in rural areas, you were the, I'm like the only OT. I worked by my, as the only OT in many settings, uh, not every setting, but many settings. And so you're like, okay, I'm hoping I'm doing the best. I can. And you're trying to find your own research and you're searching on the internet and you're reading on your books. And sometimes you just need a voice and you need someone to bounce ideas off of and have that. It's like having when you're on your field work and you have your clinical instructor and you say, Hey, Hey, you know, like I'm doing this. Is that right? Or what do you think about that? Or how do I start on this? And so it's like having that coworker that you don't have Mm -hmm. to bounce ideas off of. And so I guess it's Yeah. Hey, thanks. I think it's, you know, it's been really, really fun and I've had really good feedback. And so it's, yeah, it's been really great. But that was, that was kind of how my own journey, um, evolved. You know, it's it, honestly starting in home health. So one of the things I found kind of always tricky in home health, I think part of it is because I was a new grad, mm-hmm. um, was just some basic goal setting. What do you think? You know, we have the basics, right? The dressing and the bathing. What are some things, um, that you feel get kind of lost or missed in home health. Do you have in anything that to goal in, topics? in regards or? to goal topics? Yeah, Ooh, is there anything yes. you can think of? So this is Putting a on the tricky spot. one, but I love yeah. it though. I love the juicy questions. Um, <laughs> because so initially, when I started in home health, I was not in a place. And this is, I guess, a side note: is something if you're discerning home health, talk to your managers about what are OTs doing and what is it okay for them to do? Because some management doesn't support OTs being really outside the box. And by outside the box, I mean um, doing chronic disease management or doing Mm -hmm. diabetic lifestyle management um, or doing incorporating motivational interviewing. So Mm -hmm. ask that question. So I have a new manager. So now we can do much more because when I first started, there was such a shortage that it was like, yeah, maybe they're not managing their diabetes, but we're going to leave that to nursing mm-hmm. because they're not bathing safely. So we need you to like pick up that and we'll let nursing do this. Right. So as frustrating as that was, I get it because it's like when you have a big pie and there's only five pieces, you know what I mean? Like you have to make things work with what you've got. Yeah. So to answer your question, though, to, and kind of come back around to that, what are we missing maybe or what's mm-hmm. often perhaps overlooked. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes it can be cognition. Um, Mm -hmm. Especially, I I mean, today they say 80% of people that have cognitive impairments, it is not in their medical charts, which is alarming. Uh, Uh, Right. Because that means they're not getting the services, you know, Mm -hmm. like um, so cognition and I think diabetic management, like, are there blood sugars out of control? Is there something we could be collaboratively doing mm-hmm. with nursing? Um, and and there's one patient actually that, so uh, just to give like one quick story is PT had done the start of care with this woman. Um, she had gotten OT in, and I'm forgetting what the initial reason was on this because I know there was the bathing and mm-hmm. she had a lot of medications. So I think she was like, can you go in there and look at the meds? And this right. Andy, is actually where... I developed this little medication log for any OTs in there, uh, in there, out there who are, (laughs) who are taking on some med, med management. Mm -hmm. When you're in a house, there literally can be like 12 to 15 bottles. And when you're sitting there and you're wanting to make sure they put it in the pill box, okay, or like accurately, I about lost my mind when I didn't have something to, make sure that everything was like being accounted for. So like when I first started taking on meds is when this was hard. Mm -hmm. So I I developed this log that I think we're going to give out or put a link to um, so people can use it so that anytime you're accounting for something, you can kind of like write it down and mark what box it's in and mark any other helpful information. But anyways, back to the story. So (sighs) I go out and eval this woman knowing that it was meds that the PT was most concerned about. 
And I'm not sure why nursing wasn't in on this case, but I went out there and she had about 12 different medications. She had up to, I think, four bottles of the same one. Uh, Um, mm -hmm. Hadn't taken like the last three days at all. And then had Mm -hmm. like skipped two medications completely in the pill box. So we're able to go in and target that. And her diabetes was out of control, like 300s. We're talking Mm -hmm. blood sugar levels. Yeah. So by bringing that to the attention, getting nursing in, that patient and her partner were able to manage her diabetes. And Mm -hmm. she did have one hospital admit during our stay. But after after coming back, and I think kind of like them kind of hitting bottom, because some people, especially Mm -hmm. with diabetes, I feel like you have to hit bottom before you're like, oh, Carbs. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So diabetes management. Yeah. Cognition. Cognition. Um, caregiver training. I think yep. there's like a, um, this, uh, how would I best describe this? Like I've been really inspired lately to at eval look really clearly at how would I, how do I envision them at discharge? Mm-hmm. Like, Is that with three caregivers in the house helping or what support system are they going to need? So really thinking like big picture, right? When Mm -hmm. we start, um, no, those are good. (laughs) I'd say, I mean, I know some of the things, well, in in addition to diabetes management, it's not even just, it's like, can they see, I mean, are they doing, you know, injectables? Can Mm -hmm. they actually read it? Like, can they, you know, Mm -hmm. Could they have a fine motor to do their own, yeah. you know, do the checks? It's, and I mean, there's a lot that goes into it. So other much. things, other things that I think about, like that are maybe obvious, but sometimes I know get missed. Um, if they have pets, because pets sometimes yeah. are much more important than family. <laughs> so pet mm-hmm. care, um, you know, can they even go down and get the mail? You know, things mm-hmm. like, Laundry. do they have to, what do they do with their trash? Do they have to take the trash out to the curb? Mm -hmm. Um, those are some little things I remember thinking like, oh, these are things I need to keep in mind. And the other thing is, um, actually kind of being aware of incontinence. And that I actually, we had a a podcast talking about Mr. Covell Pearson a while ago. That's great. Yeah. And just like how that impacts people. Are they, you know, socially isolating because of it? Are they, you know, they're fall risk because they're getting up to go to the bathroom at night. Do they need a bedside commode? Should they be using a urinal? I mean, there's so many things about that, but there's, I mean, there's so, there's so many more than just the things that we've even talked about. But, you know, just thinking about kind of, like you said, outside of the box and thinking about really getting into what, what is your typical day look like? Or what yep. are some things that you do every single week? They'll be like, oh, okay, you know, I don't know. I just, I just watch TV and I, you know, they have all these stories. But then you're like, you find out that, like I said, I had one lady, I remember she's saying, but I do have to take my recycling out to the curb. And I'm thinking, how the heck are we going to, yeah. you have a walker and, but that's important to her. So yeah. we need to make sure that we can figure it out and make sure she can do it safely. So it's all those little things. Oh, I, and I love that you brought up incontinence because I do mm. think that is a huge one for skin breakdown. I mean, for UTIs, mm-hmm. so many is that reasons. something we see a lot too is the UTIs. And mm-hmm. yeah, that's, that's a really, really good one. Yeah. Oh, I love the brainstorming session, but yeah. let's kind of just like wrap it up. I, I'm like, you were mentioning before um, that Ma- Monica, see, like yeah. I'm getting, I'm getting good. <laughs> she, uh, she made everyone, um, like a medication log that we, I'm going to be putting up, um, in the show notes and also on, um, at my website. So if you go to seniorsflourish.com backslash podcast home health, she has provided us with so many links. I was like going through all these helpful links, like, you know, they're just like, do it, do it today. Strategies, quick insights about home health, just getting some information, you know, things like homebound status, emotion, you know, additional home health tips. Mm-hmm. Um, she wrote a home health ebook, which is amazing that I have actually, you know, I initially kind of, kind of found quote out about you because I, I, I had, uh, a student that had it. And so I was kind of digging through it. And then it just kind of, there's all these connections in the online world, right? But it's also a part of my recommended resource page on my website. Awesome. You know, and so there's just all these things that's like giving away so many free things and resources, which I love. <laughs> it's, I almost feel like we're Oprah, you know, like when she'd be like, and you get a free car. 
except we're like, and you get a free medication log and you get a free medication. <laughs> it's like, I like, I love the free stuff. And, you know, I love having the resources and people feeling like they um, know where they need to go to get, um, you know, evidence-based practice and um, just get good information that's useful. I mean, we don't have the time to be digging through the internet all the time. Like we do, we, I mean, we do it, but it's just like so time consuming. Yeah. And it's stressful yeah. too. And I, um, I do, can I give a quick shout out to a piece of sanity that's been really helpful yes. too? So I do think home health is, there's a, there's a lot of stress. I think that's, that that's a real thing. There's a lot of balls that you're juggling out there. And for me personally, especially when I was in the car, I really, um, I had the opportunity to get much more familiar with how I thought about things. Like, just like, what's my mental game like between patients? Um, and I really found a lot of benefit between mindfulness training and also starting a more consistent meditation practice and, and also did some research on flow. So I updated and created a handout that I personally use actually at work, like uh-huh. even to this day to help when I'm feeling really stressed because it's like, we don't, we can make choices that make our lives not so stressful. And I, the, the whole intention behind it is to really let people see what the research is saying and then to help them incorporate that into their lives, especially in the moments of stress, because I really love not just working for clients, but for fellow OTs, you know, like Mm -hmm. watching out for each other if we can. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I'll um, link to that in the show notes as well. So if everybody wants to head on over to seniorsflourish.com backslash podcast home health, we'll have all those freebies, all the um, links to all the, you know, the flow sheets and the medication logs and all the extra information um, talking about home health, just to kind of give people some really good information and see if home health is for you. So thank you so much for talking with me. Oh, thank you, Mandy. It's been a pleasure. (laughs) All right, everyone. Until next time. Hi, guys. Don't forget to check out the live courses from my sponsor, Great Seminars and Books. I love the variety of courses they offer, specifically because they are relevant to the populations that we are working with every day, older adults. And their topics include things such as home health, a specialty course of its own, and clinical implications of pharmacology for the therapist working with the older adult. So all these topics are relevant, evidence-based, and very practical. These are treatments that you can learn in the course and take back and use right away. So head on over to SeniorRehabProject.com backslash great and use my promo code SRP25 so you can get $25 off your next live course. This podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Senior Rehab Project at SeniorRehabProject.com. Thank you.